Thank you, Andy, for praying, and thank you, Priya, for reading. Let's pray that God will speak to us this morning. Lord, we thank you for these words. Lord, we thank you that the words that you go out save us, uh, reconcile, your words reconcile us um, to you and to one another. And Lord, we pray now that you will build up your body, the church, that we may live out its mission. Speak to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Olympic athletes are a bit like superheroes. They kind of look like us, but they have superpowers, don't they? They have these superpowers, but they're not bitten by spiders or anything like that. But they came to those superpowers through a lot of sacrifice. Uh, Here's Michael Phelps. He's a winner of 28 Olympic medals, 23 gold medals, two silver and three bronze. Apparently he swam, I think, 13 kilometers, eight miles each day, every day, even on Sundays, even on his birthdays, he swam and swam to acquire that superpower. Or Siobhan Howie, the two bronze uh, medal winner for, for Hong Kong, she talks about how when she was in school, she would wake up often at 3 a.m. in the morning to finish her homework, to, do, to work ahead, and then uh, at 5 a.m. go to the swimming pool to swim more so that she could go uh, to, to, to get a swim in before she starts the day at school at 7.30. You only do these things uh, for the things that you love, wouldn't you? You sacrifice for the things that you truly love. You know, in Ephesians so far, in chapters 1 and 2, Paul has been talking about the gospel, what it means, uh, what God has done for us, how we're saved by God's grace alone, and he has called us to one another, and that is the good news of the gospel. The question is, do we love the gospel enough to make any sacrifices for it? Can we live uh, for the gospel when it costs us much? Can we suffer for it? So Paul writes, you know, so he's been sort of more uh, theological, but he becomes personal in chapter 3, verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, for your sake. He's in prison right now, and it's not because of, uh, he's done something wrong. No, he's there as a prisoner of Christ, for your sake. God has called him. And he's brought this gospel to the Gentiles. And for that reason, he's now chained up in prison. Friends, the same mystery that was revealed to Paul is revealed to us. We have the same gospel. God has made this magnificent gospel available for us. He's opened our eyes so that we could see it. And the same gospel, same mystery, commissions us out to go out into the world, to work of building up the church, to bring people to, uh, uh, to be part of God's people. Will we do that? And will we continue to do that when it's hard, when it costs us something you know, there are people, some people in the, in the world who believe that um, the Christianity is something that Paul invented, the Christianity as we know it. Friedrich, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, the philosopher, German philosopher, thought that. He thought that Christianity at first was just a religion of Jesus, following Jesus, sort of Jesus' ethics, you know, the teachings of Jesus. And he says Paul perverted Christianity by making it more about Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Uh, that the focus became his death and resurrection and this gift of salvation to the world by faith in Jesus alone. He, said, he, he thought that that was Paul's invention. Well, Paul clearly thought, <coughs> taught, as we have seen in the past uh, weeks, that clearly taught that our salvation is in Jesus alone, his faith in Jesus alone, his death and resurrection. It's something that he clearly taught, but it's not something that he invented. No, it was revealed to him. And that's what he says in verse 2. Surely you have heard about the administration of God's grace that was given me to you. That is the mystery made known to me by revelation. Jesus appeared to him and revealed who he was and what he has done. He could not have thought of this himself. And you know the story, Paul, or known as Saul, back then, 
was on the way to Damascus because he was part of the system. He was Hebrew of Hebrews, Pharisee of Pharisees, and he was out going out to Damascus to persecute Christians. And on, that, on the way, uh, the bright light shone. He was blinded. He heard a voice of Jesus, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Jesus revealed himself to Paul. And the message that he could have never dreamt up himself and the mystery of salvation, God's plan to include all of the world, I was revealed to him. Actually, the Old Testament scholar Chris, uh, uh, Chris Wright says that the mystery wasn't actually the end, the end result. The end result was very clear. It was the mystery of how that was revealed to him. Have you ever seen the movie Memento? It's a 24-year-old year movie. It starts out with this gripping scene of Leonard, the main character, killing somebody, uh, killing a man named Teddy. And it's done, apparently, to avenge his wife. But that end is the beginning of the movie. And then the movie goes back chronologically to reveal why and how it happened. And like most of Christopher Nolan's movies, there's a twist that you really couldn't have dreamt up yourself. You see, the mystery that Paul is talking about is a bit like that. The end is revealed. The end is that through Israel, all of the world will be blessed. Yeah, we saw it last week, right? Uh, when I talked about Abraham and call of Abraham. And when God called Abraham, in Genesis chapter 12, he said, all of the nations, all of the world will be blessed through you. And it's not just there, it's renewed in chapter 18 and on, and, and also uh, spoken of in Isaiah. Isaiah 49 verse 6, I will make you a light for the Gentiles, and my salvation may reach the ends of the earth. There again in Psalm 72 verse 7, uh, 17, all nations will be blessed through him, and they'll, be, they'll call him blessed. The Old Testament is very clear that the mystery that was given or the, uh, the, the gospel or the law that was given uh, to Israel was to be a blessing for the whole world. But how that was going to be was a mystery because there was only one temple in the world, one priesthood in the world, and one law that God revealed to Israel, which basically required the Gentiles to become Jew through circumcision, through law, purity, law, all these things, the bar was really high. And there was that enmity, that hostility that grew over time. The Jews hated the Gentiles and vice versa. No one could have guessed how this Israel was going to become a blessing for the whole world. No one could have guessed that in a million years. But then in the beginning of Luke chapter 2, Jesus, only 40 days old, is presented in the temple. And at the temple, there was a man named Simeon who had been waiting for the Messiah to come, for the consolation of Israel, as he says. And he, when he sees Jesus, he, he knows, oh, this is it. And he sings, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all the nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. The key was Jesus. God himself would become a human being, would take on the role of Israel, God's people, and he would do all the things that God's people were supposed to do, Israel was supposed to do. He would fulfill the law perfectly and fully, and then he would die the penalty for breaking the law on the cross for us, for God's people who broke his law. And then he would rise from the dead and set aside the law and then offer uh, his gift of salvation, gift of righteousness to all those who would come to him, who would have faith in him. He would restore our relationship with him and with one another he would then mark everyone, no matter whether they were Jew or Gentile, male or free, slave or um, um, male or female, slave or free, he would mark everyone who would come to him with the Holy Spirit, saying, you are mine. You are now included. Now you can experience and know God's salvation. That was the mystery that was revealed. And that's what he says in verse 6. 
that this mystery is through the gospel. The Gentiles are heirs together with Israel, members together of the one body, sharers together in the promise of Christ Jesus. Through him, we are now included. The whole world, no matter who they are, is included together with Israel, with God's people. And we get to share that salvation together through Jesus. And I, I, I don't know if this, you, you get what this exactly means. This means that the church, our togetherness here, is the center of God's plan of redemption for the whole world. You see, our gathering, our unity across ethnicities and nationalities, preferences and personalities or whatever, our oneness, our togetherness is the mystery that nobody could have dreamt up. And this is what Jesus created through his death and resurrection, that we can be one in Christ. The church is the mystery that's revealed to, uh, to the world. This is why it's puzzling when some, some people say, well, I love Jesus, but I do not love the church. Well, how can you love the head and not the body? They are one and the same. How could we say we love Christ, but not gather as his people? Our gathering, our togetherness is what Jesus is creating. That wall of hostility is broken now. No matter who you are, we can, we can be brothers and sisters in Christ. So we meet together as his people, as his church. That's what he is doing in the world. How can we say that we love God, but then think that the church is an optional extra? Friends, how important is the church to you? Do you know that we here, this gathering here, is the center of God's plan of redemption for the whole world? God is bringing people to himself and to one another. This is what he is doing. And I know that church has flaws. I know that we are a work in progress. But we cannot abandon the plan of God's redemption. We're at the heart of God's plan. And what's heart at the, God's, at, at the heart of God's plan must be at the heart of our lives as well. So he, Paul, Paul says he's in prison for you to build up the church. And God also has then revealed this mystery to us so that we can share it with others. His grace makes us his servants. And Paul knew that he was really saved by grace, didn't he? I mean, this is something that he mentions again and again in the Bible here in 1 Timothy um, as well. In verse 8, he says he is the least, uh, he's, the, he's less than the least of all of God's people. But not only did Jesus forgive him for persecuting the church, he called him to be an apostle, apostle sent out uh, to the Gentiles. He was sent out, as we see in verse 8, to preach to the Gentiles the boundless riches of Christ, to make it plain to everyone the administration of this mystery. He's been called to go out. He's been given this mystery so that he could share it with others. And it's, it's the same with us. God has called us, given us this good news of Jesus that we're reconciled to him and to one another. Will we share this good news with others? Will his grace make us? make us his servants. I went to divinity school um, with a guy named Tyler. Uh, Tyler, who once worked for an organization called Nuclear Weapons Elimination Initiative, run by uh, 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 a retired ex-senator, uh, U.S. senator. And while wor working there, Tyler once organized a naked march in San Francisco. <laughs> and th this was uh, headed up, apparently, by, do you know Patch Adams? Pat Adams was one of the participants. He was a medical doctor who's got a movie named after him, um, and he was played by Robin Williams. It's a great movie, Patch Adams. But Patch Adams was there, and he was the one who was sort of uh, making this call from the front. That he asked the audience who were, who were gathered there, are you, what are you willing to do to get rid of nuclear weapons from the world? And then he followed up, that up by saying, are you willing to take off all your clothes and march down the street. And people there said, yes. And he said, let's go. 
and some 50 people took off their clothes and marched down the streets of San Francisco yelling out, nudes, not nukes. Nudes, not nukes. And Tyler says, you know, about that day, a few reporters wrote uh, some stories about that march, but nothing changed. Nothing changed. And he felt powerless. He felt that nothing was done. But the question rang, rang in his ears, what are you willing to do to get rid of nuclear weapons from the world? And as a young, passionate uh, activist, he thought to himself, anything, everything. I would do anything to make this happen. But he felt powerless. There was nothing that he could do. And then he writes in his book, this realization dropped me mid-stride. I saw a service stair to my right, slipped inside, and crumpled on the, uh, onto the rough concrete stair. And I wept in despair for the world I so desperately wanted to save from itself. Then, for the first and to date the cl clearest time in my life, I heard the voice of God. God said, this world is not yours. Not yours not to save or to damn. Only serve the one whose it is. Back then, Tyler wasn't particularly uh, religious. But this voice, he heard this voice, and it was clear to him. So he started going to church. He discerned a call to pastor, and he went to Divinity School where I met him, and now he's a pastor in Toronto. He's still involved in activism, but his main work now is to preach to the nations that Jesus is our peace that he has accomplished that peace in this world, that we are, we the church, are the sign of that peace. Peace between all kinds of people as we come together. That wall of hostility is crumpled down. He makes his mission is to make sure the world knows that peace in Jesus, that the church becomes a witness to that peace to the world. Church. What have you devoted your life to? Will you serve Christ? Will you be servant of his grace wherever you are? Will you devote yourselves to building up the church, his body? And I know that what we do feels insignificant completely insignificant in comparison to maybe the work of Congress, senators, uh, counselors, legislators, the executive council, wherever. But it is of cosmic importance. It is a preview of what's to come, what Jesus is bringing to the world. And look at the audience here in verse 10. His intent was that now through the church, through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm. These rulers and authorities most likely refer to the principalities and powers he mentioned in chapter 1, verse 21. In chapter 2, verse 2, he calls them the prince of the air. This is most likely referring to Satan and his forces. You know, we watch... Uh, we catch up with the news of what happened, important things that happened in the news uh, by maybe turning on the 8 o'clock news or something, or, um, or through scrolling on the social media to catch up with what happened. Church, the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm are watching the church. Watching the church, what's happening here? What's happening around the world? That's what they're watching. If they have Facebook, maybe they'll share what happened today at Shatin Church. He sowed division from the very, in the garden, from the very beginning. And he sows division around the world. But when we, as God's people, as Christ's people, as Christians, come together to worship Jesus, and to love one another, to carry one another's burdens, to, uh, uh, to be one together. When we go across our cultural and political preferences, or ethnicities and nationalities, and when we become one, they shudder. And our very existence as a church, as a multicultural, multi-political, uh, um, uh, whatever, uh, organization, is a declaration that Jesus 
has brought peace to this world, that we are signs. We are a sign of that peace. It's a declaration of God's victory over Satan. Now, this letter to Ephesians will end in chapter 6, and there Paul will describe that this whole thing is a spiritual warfare. Remember? Put on the armor of God, he will say. The church is at the center of God's plan, and its, its work is a spiritual battle. And to be honest, like, don't you feel that on Sunday mornings? On Sunday mornings, don't things go wrong? You know, don't, on Sunday morning, don't you feel like, ah, oh, man, I, maybe the, the, the bed seems just a little warmer, um, you know? Uh, or, or whenever we try to, whether it's prayer meeting or small group meetings um, uh, or worship on Sundays, our gatherings, you know, our meetings, these things feel insignificant to us, but the church is God's mystery revealed, God's salvation plan revealed, and there, is, there, there are spiritual forces battling against it. So thank you. Thank you for prioritizing the church, coming here on this Sunday, but coming to prayer meetings, giving generously to the work of the church, to meet with one another here and to share life together. That is what God is doing here. Let's continue to do that, to serve God in this way. But of, of course, the, the, the work of church also could be discouraging. It often is. If you're a small group leader, you know that. <laughs> that it's, it can often be very discouraging because, well, we're far from perfect and it feels insignificant. And these days, these years have been difficult for the churches in Hong Kong. Most, ch- I mean, most churches I know in Hong Kong have gone through at least 30 to 50% decline in numbers um, after the social movement and the subsequent COVID and protests. Gen Z, young people are not going to church these days. Men, many think that church is just an optional extra thing, even though this, even when you think differently about it. But Paul, and Paul, devoting himself to the work of the church. Well, where is he writing this letter from? He's writing it from the prison. There are many reasons to be discouraged. But as he ends this section, he says, don't be discouraged. Do not be discouraged. And there are many reasons for us not to be discouraged. And we've heard one um, today already that this, the, the church is not Paul's invention. It's not our idea It's God's idea. It's God's mystery unfurled, uh, revealed to all of us. But there's also the word therefore in verse 13, which means that we need to go to the previous sentence to see why we shouldn't be discouraged. Why shouldn't we be discouraged? Because because, uh, we can go to God in freedom and confidence, he writes in verse 12. He's talking about prayer. We can go to God in freedom and in confidence, we do not need to be discouraged. My children know, like, have no physical boundaries, <laughs> right? Whether it's church office, they barge in. Uh, bedroom, they barge in. And to the bathroom, they barge in. I started to now fear them, and so now I lock the bathroom door. But in Christ, We have that sort of access to God. We have that access to God the Father. We are not beggars. We are his children when we go to him in prayer. Why be discouraged when we can pray, when we can lift up our concerns to him? And prayer, once again, is the greatest weapon that we have in fighting the spiritual battle. Once again, if I can um, bring you back uh, forward to chapter 6, that Put on the spiritual armor of God. You know, do you remember how that ends? It doesn't end with, like, put on the armor and go fight the fight. He doesn't do that. He says, put on the spiritual armor, and what are you supposed to do? Kneel and pray. He ends that section in chapter 6, verse 18. He says, pray. Sorry, um, yeah, he says, pray for, for yourselves and pray for me. Keep on praying. And then he adds in verse 13, at the very last verse there, 
And he says, you know what? My suffering is also your glory. What does that mean? How can Paul's suffering be the glory of the Gentiles, glory of the, the church there? And I think this is because what Paul's saying is that my suffering shows how important you are. My suffering shows how important that the gospel that I have brought you is. I think that's what he means when he says, my suffering show is your glory. It shows the value and the worth of each one person gathered there. His suffering was their glory. And Jesus is suffering. In a similar way, I think, is our glory. You know, Jesus, the cross was not at first the symbol of Christianity. At first, the cross, uh, the, there are other symbols. Um, the, these two, the little fish, um, which was, was an acronym for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, or uh, Cairo, the first two letters uh, in Greek of, of Christ. These symbols were the early symbols, but then the cross took over. Over time, the cross became the symbol of Christianity. Why? Because there we see how much we're loved. There we see the weight of God's glory and how much we are loved, our value. We see it on the cross. The cross is our glory too. Friends, in the sacrifices that we make to build up the church, Christ's body, we show how the value of the gospel. When we make the sacrifice to meet with one another, to build up the church, to encourage one another to keep going, when we gather here, whatever sacrifice you made to come to church on Sunday, when you gather in small groups, it shows the value of the gospel. In fact, I, would like, I, I, think, I think only when we sacrifice, only when we make the sacrifice, to be the church, it shows to the world that we value the gospel. I became a servant of this gospel by the grace, by, by the gift of God's grace. I hope this gift of God's grace has captured you as well. Friends, God has revealed himself to us. We are stewards of this message. God has commissioned us to go, so let's keep going, building up the church, even when it's difficult, even when it requires sacrifice from us, because in our sacrifice and suffering, the world will come to know how precious this gospel is to us and to God. Let's pray. Lord, we look at ourselves and we are sometimes um, we are sometimes discouraged by what goes on here, by our sinfulness, by our divisions, by how how little we realize how precious this message is, how amazing what you are doing in the world actually is. But Lord, we thank you so much for the church here. It's your work here, that you are still at work by the power of your Spirit, gathering people from the nations to be one in Christ Jesus. Lord, help us to know with all our hearts the depth and, 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 and the richness of your grace in that. And make us your servants. Capture our hearts that we might devote our lives to you. Lord, we thank you that you are at work here. We offer ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.